And what they were particularly looking for was all the information they could gather on the China trade. So Bono being closest to the Yunnan uh, border, uh, the uh, officer in charge, his name was Daisy, uh, he writes that it had a business-like appearance. It was the second in size of the Rangoon. Uh, he writes the blue Chinese Shang dress preponderated in the town. The ratio about three to one over the Burmese dress. The Chinese, they controlled the trade in, in Bongo and all the, there were 105 gold on tables. They were very big, rich tables, controlled by uh, resident Chinese. Out of a total of approximately, I think, five or six hundred tables that they were played, made, made of uh, mud and mud houses and not all uh, very maintained. There are long lists of so imports into Burma and uh, shorter lists of exports out from Burma. And 3,000 workers were employed in the trade. Now, they seem used to sex, and as did most of the, um, the survey officers. So the map that you see here, it's based on these observations of latitudes and longitudes, and uh, plotting that with GIS technology in maps, uh, we can get very detailed accounts actually of where exactly these changes were, and combined with like Templeton's reports when it was Manipur and went to the Burma, you know, several trees that way, and then there were also other kind of reports from which we can get well, very detailed reports, actually very detailed maps uh, of the trade. Uh, so I move on now to the, the third aspect, that which deals with the kind of uh, control of land and people through the bureaucracy. Uh, and now uh, I'm now down the geographical focus. So you can see Sinesha is map, uh, as well as South Kacha, Manipur, and Arabian. Uh, following the map, it was there. Uh, the war between the company and uh, Burma, it changed the balance of power in the larger region. It actually made quite a big, big difference. Also because the company moved in so, so many uh, soldiers uh, into uh, Kachar. So the company had a stronger hold after uh, the mid-1820s. Uh, and, uh, but, but at the same time, we should remember that the company was comparatively weak. We shouldn't think of eating their company as very strong. They were actually relatively weak in relation to all the other political powers. Um, but along the rivers, I mean, their control extended from the rivers and from the merchant towns. They didn't control the entire territory, but it came from the rivers were the most important to control. If you control the rivers, you control uh, a lot of other things uh, at the same time. Uh, so after getting control after the war, that is when the company began to also subject the neighboring kingdom by treaty. Now the means by which the company established control uh, was that they was charged with legal force. So uh, it was important for the company, uh, as they were acting on royal charters, uh, to legitimize every step by legal codes or confirmed by legal regulations. Uh, so even if much of what they did was pretty haphazard and sometimes just real mistakes, they could not easily be undone. Because once you put something into a legal code, you cannot just throw it overboard and say you don't care. You have to relate to that code. And then there is space for interpretation and adjustment. But you cannot just go away and say you don't care. So these codes are actually very, uh, very important. Um, yeah. However, uh, and this is my argument, that the annexation of the Mughal or the demonic territories on the one hand, and the subjugation of the autonomous kingdoms, they took place under very different preconditions. So the legal frameworks uh, that were made to govern people and territory were profoundly different at the very outset. Uh, we may even argue that what the, uh, the company, through their practice of administration, uh, accomplished uh, resulted in different kind of policies, even if under one government. 
So the crisis of the of Ethiopia and the administration in each locality resulted also in different ruler subject relations. So the subject relations is a deep one in territories. I will come back to it and explain it further. It rested on fiscal relationships primarily. And the fiscal relationship means that it is vested with rights. You have rights which are vested in the polity. Uh, while compared to subject relations in the former kingdoms, they were much weaker or even non existent. So previous historical research on colonial history and gold has been dominated by political and agrarian history. And that's a very good reason for this. Very important historical work has come out. Um, the revenue settlements were systematically planned and they were incorporated in the, uh, they incorporated Silhet and Kachar districts, at least South Kachar, into the general administration of Bengal. Now it has been emphasized, there is an argument uh, saying that uh, there was a need for land revenue income. Uh, because the wars are very expensive, so we need the, the land revenues uh, to maintain the conquest. So this is a reason to push for further conquest, so that we can get more land revenues. The, the land revenue files uh, are huge. And there are lots of reports which show in detail that there is an expansion of cultivated land, and this expansion results in an increase of revenue income. However, if we look closer into the administration of land, which means we also need to look at the land which never produced any revenue. We get quite a different picture of the situation. So the first revenue settlement, this is the December settlement of 1790. This settlement was made in haste. The district was heavily understaffed. They were short of time, and the officers were completely flooded with litigation. They had to mediate in that conflict so much that they could not even leave the officers keep complaining about this. So that is the perspective of the descending settlement. It was expected to fix boundaries of cultivated fields for people so fighting over it uh, and just stop the litigation. So the, the survey was therefore pushed through uh, over, I think, for some 20,000 um, settlements, something like that, perhaps a little more. Uh, there were three revenue classes cultivated, fallow, and waste. But waste was jungle, so waste was forest. Now, since cultivated land was seen as the only productive land, this uh, resulted in only cultivated land was taxed. The rest of the land was tax-free. And all individuals who were reported to have this cultivated land in what was said by possession or occupation, these are two different legal, um, it, it's important to divide it whether it's occupation or possession. And they were noted as land owners, which included lots of tenants and sub-tenants. And the most important result of the survey was uh, that the government got a very detailed, even if not always correct, information about land and cultivators. This is crucial information for any government, that a government needs a formalized relationship with subject, the people living in the territories, within that realm. So the DRM, which was such a realm, it included also such subjects. So the revenue settlement, what it means in 1790, was to fix people to land and to cultivate it landscape. Now the importance of land ownership brings us into the question of the rights of subjects to the British Crown. What does it mean to be a British subject? There are lots of new British subjects here. On the one hand, there were leading principles which could never be bypassed. Uh, like the common law. No officers could just say we don't care about the common law, it was there. On the other hand, there was a practice of rule where the officers bent and adjusted any principle to achieve their particular aims. Um, there was an uh, unquestioned quality of British subjects in both the British Isles and the Bengal uh, that they were to be secure to life and property. The property is what gave a man a right as an individual and as a subject. And remember in the 19th century you had to have property in order to have a political right, the right to vote. Without property you were not allowed to vote, you had to have a certain level of it. Um, so this made the question of property very, very sensitive in that that's not in India. The president has been dealt with it in very different ways for different reasons. Now, in Bengal, property would make subjects visible as they would emerge as an administrative category. They needed subjects, but here they emerged. 
But he would also provide them with a legal voice as citizens in court, so these subjects had civic rights. These two relations were certainly not the only relations uh, between rulers and subjects, but they were certainly the most extensive and systematic. So um, we may think of the British subjects in the new world territory as fiscal subjects. Um, to me, this is a useful terminology. Um, we can, if you wish, discuss the political uh, rights included in subjects, but I do that now. Now, three years after the decennial settlement, uh, uh, this settlement was included under the principles of the large permanent settlement of the Gore 1793. So by this decision, then, which was once classified, could never be reclassified. The interesting years, the, the administrators realized the huge mistake uh, of uh, having this permanency in a classification of land when lands that were uh, classified as cultivated land turned into lakes. And when the forests were put on the plow and it could not be reclassified, forest was forest, never to be reclassified as cultivated. So you can say a forceful mismatch between nature and land administration. Um, the revenue department in Calcutta, you can see this difference between Calcutta and the district administration. In Calcutta, they would be arguing for uniform application of principles of permanent settlement, but there was someone who had to do the job and they had to negotiate every step. Uh, so if we return to the argument that revenue income was a driving force for colonial conquest, we need to look at the total land under the revenue settlement. This shows that 25% uh, of the lands that were surveyed were classified as cultivated and thereby assessed. So 25% was tax free. 25% of the surveyed land uh, equals 13% of the total land in the land district. So only 13% resulted in revenue. And I mean, as we know something about statistics, even if you then get an increase of cultivated land uh, and an increase of uh, revenue income, it can still be not very much compared to the totality. So one needs to ask the question then, if revenue income was not the issue, then what was the issue? Why could this huge settlement be played uh, if they were not so keen on getting an income from it? Now this changed over time, obviously they wanted an income, but initially this was not the issue. So we had a continuous conflict between government and district administration. And Calcutta was pushing for uh, transforming the landscape into large scale agrarian production, while the district administration was very pragmatic. Um, and uh, there, there was a big difference between intentions and policies, and the carrying out of these policies. Um, this, now, this is the situation in the new mm -hmm. territory. If we compare this to uh, the annexed kingdoms, those that were tied into the British uh, territories through treaties, uh, we get a different uh, view. Now, the military strength of the company was definitely much stronger than any of that of the kingdoms. But the kingdoms had other comparative advantages, particularly they had place-based knowledge, something which the company did not have. So nature weighed heavily against the company. The company troops had no skills to carry out warfare in the hills, and thousands died within weeks in the forest from malaria. You could see how they, unless they were thrown into battle, they had to immediately be pulled out, well, they would die anyway. Um, also, um, law restrained military advance, even if the, the uh, mosquitoes were more effective, I would say. The, the demon justified sovereignty over the motherland, but uh, to wage a war against defenseless kingdoms that had never committed any hostile act against the East India Company that could never be legitimized. So until the end of the anglo burmese War, the company advanced by making alliances. However, uh, the boundaries between, if you now I keep apart the Timorian territories or the Dimona territories from uh, the kingdoms, there weren't any firm boundaries. We shouldn't think of uh, like this nation-state notion of of boundaries. They were very porous and not least because of commerce and the merchants that had access to uh, the wealth of the kingdom. Uh, this was basically by loot and contract. 
Now the commercial interest stands out on this site in the conquest of Jaintia, money to catch out the copper state or cheaper uh, The company sought mineral wealth and they controlled of routes of communication to trade and troops. They particularly wanted to connect the Brahmaputra with the Surma uh, And the administration which was set up reflects a minimal interest uh, in forming relations to subjects. Uh, after the war, late 1820s, there was a series of treaties signed with Rajas and chiefs, primarily castle Rajas. Now these treaties have a prehistory. Uh, the first one is 1762. It's a treaty between the Raja of Mani Pujaisi and East India Company uh, against Burma. Uh, and this is a commercial slash military alliance kind of treaty. 1824 comes the next treaty, so that is with Kachari Jaitya, and they were put under so-called protection as war allies. Uh, so in, in that perspective, we should see the later treaties, um, and uh, that comes in the 30s. So it's kind of, a, it, they are squeezed harder and harder, but it's the same commercial logic behind these treaties. Uh, the guiding principle was suzerainty, was of course subsidiary alliance, the company could charge for foreign relations and domestic affairs were left to the Rajas, and in each case there were particular clauses that tailor made the treaties to each situation. For example, there is a treaty with the many coffee states after a widespread revolt in 1829. Now, these treaties were formed as punishment, and penalty was imposed in extraction of limestone. It was dedicated in the office and forever. Um, it also included making and maintaining roads and so on. Uh, also, there, there is the important treaty of 1835, which uh, in, in which Jaintia lost uh, its economy. But I think most importantly, just to wind up, um, these treaties with, with these treaties, there was no relationship established with subjects beyond the ruler or the, uh, the raja or chief. And also these uh, treaties, the way in which they were tailor-made, appears to have weakened the civic rights uh, in this, these annexed kingdoms. Uh, so the, these are the subject rights. They became different kinds of British subjects. Uh, these, the civic rights have underpinned uh, the rights of subjects in the demonic territories. They appear to have been weakened already at the outset in the annexed kingdoms. Um, where, where they were basically in the or non existent. I thought I should finally just show you just see it's a little bit